All right. I've got 11 o'clock on my clock. Attendees will still uh, come on in. But first off, hello and welcome to the Chorus Forum. Uh, today's forum is on mapping the research cycle, connecting the pieces. So today's forum of over 230 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. Now a little bit about Chorus. We are a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goal is to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research, and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. So a housekeeping note. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. And feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so that we are sure to get to them. Today's forum will run until 12.30 p.m., thereabouts, Eastern Daylight Time, and will also be recorded for later viewing. We will start by outlining the problem with Phil Jones from the More, More Brains Cooperative and Laurie Schultz, the Assistant Vice President of Research Intelligence at the University of Arizona. We'll then move on to solutions from Steve Finchotti, the CEO of Altum, Carly Robinson, the Assistant Director for Information Products and Services at OSTI USDOE, and Sean Ross, Professor of History and Archaeology of Macquarie University and also the Product Manager of ARDC. That will then be followed by a panel discussion, which will include all of the speakers above and adding in Kevin Boyer, Professor of Computer Science and Engineering from the University of Notre Dame, and Scott Deneen, Director, Senior Director, excuse me, of Production and Technology at Optica. So without any further ado, over to you, Phil. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Howard, and thank you to everyone for coming to today's uh, webinar, uh, today's forum. My name is Phil Jones, and I'm a co-founder of the More Brains Cooperative. We're a consultancy working in scholarly publishing, communications and research infrastructure. I'm coming to you today from sunny Edinburgh in Scotland. So I wanted to kick things off by giving you a quick overview of why tracking research throughout its life cycle is important and what's been happening that shows that more and more stakeholders are taking this increasingly seriously. So next slide, please. Please. Before I make the pitch that research information and persistent identifiers are vital to a well-functioning scholarly ecosystem, I want to reassure everybody that this isn't just something that we on today's panel are just making up and claiming. A quick look on the web and through various policy documents at national and intergovernmental level will show you that over the past few years, folks like G7, the European Commission, UNESCO, the White House Office of Science and Technology have released statements, policies and memos in various forms indicating that research should be open, results of it should be available and its impacts and rewards should be trackable. Next. One venue where these issues are being discussed that I'm familiar with is at the Research Data Alliance, which is a community driven initiative founded by the European Commission, the NSF and NIST in the US and the Australian Department of Innovation. RDA hosts a national PID strategy interest group with representatives from a wide variety of countries. Now, looking at the conversations and outputs from that group and the policy landscape in general and the discussions in general in the space, there are three areas of interest that really leap out, at least to me. One of them is open research, including open access and fair data. Um, another is understanding research impact so that governments and funders can understand what it is that they're paying for and why. And, uh, and the last is reducing the bureaucracy, um, which uh, if we're not careful, and as I'm sure many of you will appreciate, can be an unintended consequence of those other two drivers. Now, I should say that Laurie is going to expand a little bit on this list in terms of the US context, so I won't steal her thunder here, I'll just leave it at that. Now, you may have noticed on this slide, the word PID is pretty central to it. And this poses the question of what this PID word means and why it keeps getting mentioned, or at least by me. Next. Well, PIDs are, as the slide says, long-lasting, globally unique identifiers that are resolvable. 
The obvious example that people usually familiar with is the DOIs. If you click a DOI, it'll bounce you through to a URL where you can read or download the article or the resource that you're looking for. Simple. There is more to them than that, though. PIDs are generally associated with metadata registries, which are hopefully open themselves. And importantly, they have governance structures that aim to guarantee that they will continue to function indefinitely or as close to that as possible to, uh, possible to assure or to guarantee. Next. Throughout the work that we've done at More Brains through various consultations and engagements, we have found that five particular entities emerge as important to be uniquely identified and cross-connected. I won't go into details for time's sake about how we sort of arrived at these, but suffice to say that these five, research grants, people, outputs like publications and data sets, projects themselves and organizations, come up time and time again for a wide variety of metadata workflow and interoperability use cases, whether that be monitoring open access policy compliance, research assessment, or minimizing bureaucracy. Next. So what is it about PIDs that makes them so very useful? Why do I keep talking about them? Well, it's clear that they represent important parts of the research ecosystem, but how do that, how does that manifest? How do those use cases that I mentioned manifest themselves? Well, the label part is very important. If you identify something as a PID, you can be absolutely sure that what you're referring to is the right thing. For example, if you search for my name, which happens to be Phil Jones, you'll get millions of possible matches, whether you're looking on Google or on an academic uh, database. Very few of which very few of those people are anything to do with me. Um, I happen to know, for example, there's a Phil Jones that plays midfield for Manchester United Football Club. There's another one that teaches bass guitar in South Wales. And there's another one is one of those big inspirational, big stadium inspirational speakers from New York. None of those people are me. But if you find my publications based on my ORCID ID, then you know that you have the right person. But they're more than just a label, as I say. They're also linked to the metadata, which critically, that enables the PIDs to link to one another. In a couple of slides, I'll briefly talk about why that's really important for tracking research throughout its life cycle, which is the topic of today's forum. Lastly, it's very useful um, that the metadata can be read by computers using technology like APIs and so forth. And that's where a lot of the automation and the bureaucracy reduction comes in that I mentioned. Next. So let's talk about the first of those policy facets, if you like, open research. In the UK, the interest in PIDs and better connected metadata came out of the drive towards open access and open research. It was from a piece of work commissioned by JISC in the UK that, that first identified those five priority PIDs as being necessary for open access workflows in particular. Um, and as you can see here, the European Commission Fairs Fair project has also cited uh, PIDs as being fundamental to open research, in that case, uh, actually open data. Next. So let's look at, uh, at uh, research assessment and the tracking of impact, which was another one of those facets. As I mentioned earlier, this is where the idea of tracking research throughout its life cycle really comes into play. Because if all of these entities were connected through their associated metadata, it would be possible to easily find answers to important questions like, what are the grants that are associated with a particular research project? Or the people that are associated with a given university? What surprises a lot of people is that even in this day and age, questions like this aren't already easy to answer. But I can assure you that having worked in this field for a while, they're not. And that's what's driving a lot of the interest and a lot of the investment that we're currently seeing. So some of our other panelists, particularly Carly Robinson, I think from the Department of Energy and Sean Ross from ARDC will be talking a bit more about those efforts. So next. Here are a couple more links to policy resources that you might be interested in, in, the, in this case, focusing on how metadata and PIDs can help track research and measure its impact. Uh, there's a slide deck from the PID Advisory Board, with a, which has a variety of European stakeholders and an excellent uh, NVO PID strategy document from 2021, both worth, uh, well worth having a look up and having a read if you have the chance. Next. The last area of interest to highlight is administrative burden or excessive bureaucracy. You've probably heard already um, that researchers are increasingly struggling with workload and find themselves spending way too much time doing tasks that are not their core job. As I mentioned before, um, this can, if we're not careful, be an unintended consequence of some of the other efforts like tracking impact and making things open. Um, to, uh, as researchers can end up weighed down, if you like, by constantly having to manually re-enter metadata into multiple systems, whether that be for a funding application, for example, submitting an article, or just updating their own institutional information systems. Next. 
I have to admit that this is a bit of a personal bugbear of mine. We at More Brains uh, have done some work on the scale of the time wasted due to this unnecessary uh, bureaucracy and administration, particularly in the UK and in Australia. Um, that's where we focused some of our research. What we found is that the numbers are pretty eye-watering. In the UK, we estimate that about 55,000 person days are needlessly wasted rekeying re information that could simply be pulled across from one information system to another were the integrations and the metadata in place. Whether that be from a funder database to an institutional research management system or from an ORCID record to a publishing submission system. That equates to 19 million pounds a year in wasted uh, salary and costs. In Australia, we found similarly high numbers, 38,000 person days being wasted every year. Now, we haven't done this calculation for the US, but our guess is it will be a lot bigger because the size of the research sector and the output of the US is much higher than either the UK or Australia. Next. So having told you that uh, grim story of waste, I will leave you with a story of hope. Uh, you can look this up later yourself if you have a chance to, to do a quick search in your favorite search engine for Joe's ORCID story. Joe Shapter is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research Infrastructure at the University of Queensland in Australia. In 2021, he was interviewed by the Australian Access Federation about why he originally got interested in research infrastructure. As the story goes, prior to 2018, when a, re when a researcher applied for a grant from the Australian Research Council, the AARC, they were required to submit a typeset CV with a very particular set of formatting rules. To be fair, um, I must point out that having unnecessary fiddly or overly analog or per persnickety processes for extre are extremely common in uh, many research environments around the world. What's interesting and different here is that ARC actually chose to do something about it. And they implemented an ORCID integration. And all this ORCID integration needs to do is pull in a researcher's record uh, through the API and enable them to select publications uh, that were automatically formatted, automatically formatted uh, in the correct way. And Joe says that this simple integration, pulling this metadata across, saves him three to four uh, three to four days of work on every grant application. Now you can imagine across the entire ecosystem, that's an awful lot of saved time and an awful lot of reduced frustration. Next. So hopefully I've given you a bit of an overview of some of the challenges and the issues involved with tracking research over its life cycle and, uh, and a hint at some of the directions that we might choose to solve some of these problems. And I'm now gonna hand you over to uh, Laurie, Laurie Schultz, who will go into a little bit more detail, particularly about the US context and in particular researcher burden. Okay, over to you, Laurie. Thanks so much, Phil. Uh, so I'm Laurie Schultz, I'm at the University of Arizona and I am also a member of the ORCID Board of Directors. And can I get the next slide, please? And what I really wanted to talk today is what researcher burden looks like in the US, particularly around federal grant making entities. On one of Phil's slides, he mentioned the admin burden calculation across a number of countries. Uh, the US unfortunately falls into the higher bucket there. Um, there have been several survey measures over the year that estimate that researchers in the US who are federally funded spend 42% of their time on things that are not the research. And so that's what we quantify as administrative burden or workflow here. And really the, to set the context for what's happening in the US on a federally funded grant, at the proposal stage and at the progress reporting stage, they're still responding to the construct of forms. And I, and I say paper and PDF, but while, while those things are submitted online today, the construct is still the same. It's still a, a, symbol, a single snapshot of a point in time. It is not a robust data set that is reused over and over again. Um, and there are no integrations with the source of information that needs to be in those things, in the applications for funding, in the progress reporting information throughout the life of a grant. So that can include things like their appointments and affiliations, a list of their publications and, data, and related data sets, and any outcomes that might be captured as a result of the work that's funded by a federal grant. And a lot of this funding is independent of publication workflow. So there's, for a federal agency or for a grantee organization like mine, there isn't a really great way to determine ROI on publications linking to a single grant. Um, that we have to do a lot of work to get there. So there's a lot of rekeying data because there's not integration with the sources of information. And there is a lot of things that could be linked together, but takes a lot of work of, of data analysis to put together at any one institution or even at a federal agency for instance. Can I get the next slide, please? 
And that burden is changing all the time. Um, right now, uh, we, we in the US have uh, a, a upcoming data management and sharing policies. One is already in existence for our National Institutes of Health. And I put the dollar amount of R&D there just to show the scale of how many researchers are impacted by these requirements. Um, and so these things are you know, requirements for deposits of articles and data sets in repositories to demonstrate compliance with the data management and sharing policies. Where the burden can exist is um, these repositories are all over the place. In some cases, like in the NIH example, there might be one that is required, but a single investigator may need a deposit in more than one source, including if their institution has a policy about depositing publications and data sets, they may want to deposit in a discipline specific repository, for instance. So, you know, they could be putting the same information in three or four places as a result of these policies. And this is only growing. In August of 2022, something came out that we call now the Nelson Memo from the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy that expands that data management and sharing to other federal R&D funding agencies. And really what that memo is about is public access to the results of federally funded research. Um, and it expands those policies to all U.S. federal, federal agencies that fund R&D. Previously, there had been a threshold that if an agency fell below it, they didn't have to do this. But what that memo also does is talk about the end of an allowed embargo period for articles. That is something that used to be true. And a requirement the, that the associated data with a publication be available upon publication. And we're expecting implementation for the rest of the federal agencies in 2025 and 26, depending on the agency. Um, but the news there is that there are 26 of these agencies. And so the possibility that there could be many sets of rules that overlap and conflict is high. Uh, so the use, the use of PIDs in the, in the you know, ORCID to publication DOI to data set DOI life cycle, including something also for, you know, a, a DOI for grants can help make that chain of compliance a little easier to suss out because today those things are not connected. Um, and we're all struggling here at universities to understand how compliance with these policies will be measured uh, when that information is linked, not linked together and what is going to be our responsibilities, both as institutions and as researchers to ensure we're doing the right thing and complying with U.S. federal policy. A lot of these things are not new. There are other non-federal sponsors that have had sharing guidelines for years. But where this is where this is really going is this is becoming the norm across these funding agencies, and it will filter down into non-US federal agencies. The good news, however, is in the OSTP guidance, they are saying that PIDs need to be included in the minimum, minimum metadata for scholarly publications and data. So it's a good step in the right direction as we start to link this information together, both for compliance reasons and for just understanding what our faculty are doing. Next slide, please. Another thing that's coming up, and some of you may have heard of this, uh, this research security and undue foreign influence problem uh, by the cryptic acronym NSPM 33. Um, NSPM stands for National Security Presidential Memorandum 33. And what this is really about are areas where there is undue foreign influence in violating things like the confidential peer review process for manuscripts and proposal applications, i.e. people sharing information outside of those constructs. Um, and it's, you know, doing things like not disclosing affiliations or appointments or other funding that might duplicate US federal funding efforts. Um, and so where, where PIDs really come in here is the ability to uh, reuse data around things like affiliations, like things, things like appointments, like things like a current funding profile, like what grants a person has, um, how they might, so that an, an analysis can be made about how they might overlap with a pending grant that's on the table. And it really is also about protecting research work. The, in, the, in the undue foreign influence realm, we, like I said, we we're really talking about areas where we're violating the peer review process. And for me, protecting their work means it must there must be some attribution in the data. So we must have a way to identify a person with a publication slash idea with a data set that got to that idea. <clears throat> and PIDs can help us get there. And one of the things that we can do with, with foreign influence as things, as US legislation identifies areas where we want to keep an eye on how our researchers are collaborating across the world, um, we can monitor those collaborations in the PID universe. Like who are co-authors? Who are the people who were also working on that data set that resulted in that publication? And we can also use them, you know, things like ORCID 
to disclose collaborations that require information on appointments and affiliations and scholarly output. So that universe can really bring those bring these things together about who you are, where you work, and who you're working with in the result of scholarly communications. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the things we're working on in with PIDs to reduce that burden. Um, there is there is a tool now called Science CV that reuses data from ORCID. So a U.S. investigator applying for federal funding can use Science CV to generate some of those forms I was talking about by connecting their ORCID record for things like appointments and affiliations and their publications and other scholarly output. Um, a lot of U.S. universities and federal agencies are talking about how to include ORCID in their institutional grants management systems. And at the university level, we are looking at it and saying, okay, the U.S. federal requirements are coming for data management sharing, for research security and undue foreign influence. How do we use those requirements to, uh, to leverage policies at our own institutions to encourage, encourage folks to have an ORCID, to keep their records updated so that this, this whole universe works? You know, data is organic and the more people use it, the better it gets. And for us, you know, PIDs are fair. They help linking out, they help link outputs, people and organizations, all the way from a proposal and the data management plan to grant publications and data sets. And then my next slide, please. And the benefits there, you know, as many of you are probably already aware, is that over time we do get reduced burden. Uh, the more that we're able to automate uh, form generation, reuse data instead of typing data in over and over again, and understanding how sponsor U.S. like U.S. sponsor requirements vary in the data is really important. Um, it helps us manage what compliance might look like with these policies so that we have a faster way to monitor connections between a person and their output and what might be funded by a particular grant or another grant. And it helps with our progress to open and public access, both around um, the policies that are coming for public access for federal research and an institution's own, own aspirational goals for how they want their research to be expressed in public. And you know, last but not least, uh, the, the use of PIDs has implication across a number of ROI activities at US universities and beyond. And that includes things like our shared infrastructure or core facilities beyond billing. So if I have if 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 I have a PID assigned to an electron microscope that is used across campus and used by other organizations. Being able to cite that instrument in a publication helps me in a lot of ways that understanding who's paying for the use of that equipment it does not help me understand. It helps me map collaborations across my own institution and across the globe, and it gives us a little more insight on the reach and impact of, of a single project, whether that is funded by one grant or multiple forces of, uh, sources of funding so that our researchers understand how the work they're doing translates across the globe. And with that, um, those are my comments, and I think I'm turning it over to Steve. Thank you, Lori. Hi, my name is Steve Pinchotti. I'm the CEO at Altum. I'm also a ORCID board member. I'm here to talk about the journey to faster ROI and impact assessment from the research funder perspective. Next slide, please. So our mission at Altum, if you're not familiar with us, uh, our goal is to empower the entire funding process. So we work with global funders that are, are doing tremendous amount of work um, to award the best research and best science out there. And we do our best to help empower that whole process. And ever increasingly connecting a greater part of this research community, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then ultimately extend the impact well beyond the life of a grant. Uh, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about what we're doing with ORCID. Next slide, please. Just give you some sense of the scale of, of what we're dealing with um, and who we work with. Um, Proposal Central is our grants management platform. It's a SaaS platform. Uh, we work with global funders. So we work with um, funders all over the world. We've seen $27 billion pass through and manage uh, grants in, in Proposal Central. We're approaching 850,000 global users and we just recently just surpassed our 2 millionth peer review critique where people are coming in and reviewing grant applications um, and work with tens of thousands of research institutions globally. So you can imagine just from the first two presentations that you've heard, um, the, the standards and the practices across the board um, in Asia, Saudi Arabia, Europe, North America, Africa, 
um, to make those consistent and work with them. Um, it, it's incredibly challenging for a platform like ours that that where there may be very strict open science uh, requirements in one country, but not in others, or use of persistent identifiers in one place and not in others. So our role is to try to help um, bring all these organizations together and standardize them the best way we can. Next slide, please. So in this conversation regarding the research funding community, uh, we certainly want to help accelerate the adoption of persistent identifiers. I'm going to talk about that on the next few slides. Uh, and then we promote open science the best that we can, work with the funders to, to talk about this. Um, and most funders will promote it in a way where they'll publish their awarded grants on their websites. Um, we'll take that to the next level and I'll talk about that. Uh, and then certainly you heard already, um, the, the reduction of administrative burden is, is always front and center in my mind. Um, to hear Lori's stat is amazing, a 42% of, of researchers' time is not spent on the, the research um, is staggering. So uh, we think about that every day and figure out ways that we can streamline these workflows. Uh, and then to help funders uh, expedite ROI analysis and, and impact assessment, um, Phil mentioned, you think you should be able to you know, answer these questions easily. It, it is absolutely not an easy process. And, and we've been talking to our funders and we've been calling it detective work that when they have to provide information to their boards, their donors, constituents, other uh, staff, executive staff. Um, it, it really is time consuming and laborious. So th those are key areas to, to focus on and I'll talk about that more. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been partners of ORCID for a long time. We've been promoting ORCID within our community for a long time. And there's, I think, tremendous benefits with this. Um, and one of the things we show here on the screen slide is that when, when researchers come to Proposal Central, with one account and one profile, you can apply to any grant opportunity with any of our funders globally. And when you first sign up with an account, the easiest thing you can do is just update all of your data from ORCID. So if you're maintaining an ORCID profile, uh, you just click this update profile from ORCID link and, and you see on the right hand side there, your education, your employment, and then further below, um, you know, works and events and all the other parts of the ORCID profile pull down into Proposal Central as well. So very streamlined, very easy. Um, don't want anybody rekeying information, as Phil mentioned in his talk. And then the other thing that we do with ORCID is the funders can also um, push. So it's a two-way interface. So they can push those awards that the researchers get back to their ORCID profile. Looks like we've lost the screen share. Something happened with the screen share. Oh, I think we. I think we may have lost Howard. Okay. Well, it looks like we did. Let me. Apologies, don't know what happened. I have the slides up, I can keep going. Okay. Here's how he's come back. Okay. All right. pa pa power outage, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> keep going, Steve, sorry. Okay. Well, we need. Howard, we need the slides that. up again. It lost everything. All right. There we go. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, the funders and our, all of our customers can can push award data back to uh, researchers' ORCID records. So when I talk to people at ORCID, you know, I say the last thing we want researchers to be doing is maintaining an ORCID profile manually. So anything we can do to streamline that, update things automatically. Um, and that's great. And, and we also, depending on the ORCID trust levels, um, if they trust in Proposal Central, then all this, all this syncing back and forth happens automatically. The researcher actually doesn't even have to come in and do this manually. So um, I don't know how many people know this, but there are currently over 4,000 global system integrations with ORCID, which is pretty amazing. We think ORCID has been around for 10 years. So it's, it's more than an average of one per day that have been created over its lifespan. Um, so pretty amazing. So I think, you know, over overall, researchers are going to interface with ORCID. I think they're almost at their 20 million ORCID ID issues. So definitely um, pretty amazing. And, and one other stat about this that I'll tell everybody, in Proposal Central, we've seen the adoption rate where principal investigators submit grant applications with an ORCID ID has gone from 50% in 2018 to now 82%. So it's it's definitely increased and that's amazing. Uh, we're not quite at 100% because um, there are still some funders out there that weigh this 
sort of value versus burden perspective. And they think that asking researchers for ORCID IDs is considered an extra burden. Um, so there's still some work to do there to, to work through that and, and streamline that process. All right, next slide, please. And another thing that we're doing recently um, is doing more integration with Roar. So this is an example of Virginia Tech Institute, and then on the right-hand side showing its Roar ID there. Um, what we're doing right now is specifically around converting data when, when new funders join Proposal Central, um, there's a lot of data transformation, there's data cleanup, we're moving data into Proposal Central. And at that point, we really are taking their institution records and their institution profiles and mapping them to Roar ID. Um, what we will be doing is continuing this integration so that when researchers apply for grants in Proposal Central, that they're selecting Roar IDs and not typing in Virginia Tech in various different <laughs> numerations of how that could happen. So um, that's the goal is to standardize everything in Proposal Central with, with the PIDs, and we will be doing more integration with Roar um, in the coming months and years. Next slide, please. And then I mentioned, you know, open science and funders depositing their awards, you know, displaying them on their public awards, that are, um, on their websites. Um, but we now have an integration with Crossref, so encouraging our funder customers to deposit the grant metadata to Cro the Crossref funder registry and get those DOIs. And so this is an example of a page in Proposal Central where an, a funder can come in, search their awards, and then select which ones they would like to publish to, to Crossref. So once they, once they find the list, they can select one at a time or they can select them all, and then they just click that register update Crossref DOI button and everything gets deposited and they get their DOIs. Next slide. And so this is just an example of showing an actual grant award in Proposal Central and you see the Crossref DOI there on the bottom right. And then one more slide, please. And then if you go to the Crossref funder registry and you search on any of the funders from Proposal Central that have deposited data and you get those DOIs, you click on them, it will resolve back to a page in Proposal Central, a landing page that provides all the information about that grant award. So um, this is still also relatively early days. Um, there's approximately 10% of the funders in Proposal Central that are doing this today. But as you as you heard earlier with the uh, all the things happening with the Nelson memo and all this push for open science, um, we will see that number continue to rise over time. Next slide, please. Okay, so just some final thoughts on, on opportunities. I think focusing on early career researchers is key. The more that they learn about this ecosystem and persistent identifiers and certainly getting their ORCID profiles early uh, will help just keep that you know, connected to so many different parts of this ecosystem is, is very important. Um, and then whatever we can do to encourage more funders to support the research infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of funders that out there that, you know, and, and rightfully so, right? They wanna use their resources wisely and fund world-class research. Um, but there is also a part that, you know, they should help continue of this entire infrastructure. So whether that's ORCID or data site or ROAR, um, I think funders can do more to contribute to that area. Um, and then just, as I mentioned, implement better data standards. So when we're moving data around between systems or people are migrating to Proposal Central, um, most systems out there today are not using ROAR. They're not using PIDs in these ways. And so it's one thing to move data around, but it's also very important to to map the data to these standards. Um, so it's just easier across the board to do the reporting and, and get that ROI and the impact assessment that we talked about. Um, so certainly feedback is, is always welcome on how we can improve and your thoughts. And I look forward to hearing everyone or hearing from you at the, in the Q&A panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. That was, uh, that was great. So now it's Carly is uh, gonna talk a little bit about, um, yes, about the work at the DOE. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Carly Robinson from the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're connecting research components using persistent identifiers. So if you go to the next slide, uh, just a little bit of kind of background about my organization and how we fit within the Department of Energy. Um, so OSTI, or the Office of Scientific and Technical Information, we work to collect, preserve, and disseminate all of DOE-funded R&D uh, results. 
And so kind of how that works is the DOE program offices fund about $12 billion annually. Um, all of that money is going outside of DOE to either the national laboratories or to grantees at universities and other institutions. And they're producing from that funding um, about 50,000 R&D outputs each year that we're working to collect. So these are things like journal article accepted media scripts, software, data, technical reports. And so that is where my office comes into the process, trying to collect all of those research outputs um, for long-term preservation and the, disseminating it um, publicly as much as possible. And so one of the core functions that we have to help with our mission is to provide and use persistent identifier services. So on the next slide, um, you know, when we're talking about persistent identifiers, we're using uh, the definition that comes from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And the definition is um, a little bit technical, but uh, it, it's defined as a digital identifier that's globally unique, persistent, machine resolvable and processable, and has an associated metadata schema. And so when we're thinking about persistent identifiers, we're thinking about identifiers that meet this definition. And we're also thinking about persistent identifiers throughout the research life cycle. So um, in this graphic that I created, you know, this is just kind of some examples of when you can think about persistent identifiers throughout out the research life cycle. And you know, you, you've heard the benefits of persistent identifiers and kind of specifically what we're hoping to use persistent identifiers for is to ease administrative burden, help with disambiguation, make sure that folks receive the proper credit, help with reporting, um, enabling broad dissemination and making connections, and also working to kind of start to understand some of the impact of our funding through using persistent identifiers. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the different persistent identifier services that we provide. So if you remember kind of where we are within the DOE um, research life cycle, we're more towards the end, um, kind of historically working to collect the research outputs. So that's really where we started in our work with persistent identifiers. Um, and this goes back all the way to 2005 we, when we became Crossref members first to be able to assign DOIs to, um, to the technical reports because we were the only organization that was making that was publicly available. But we're trying to work within the normal workflow for researchers who get DOE funding. And so part of when you accept DOE funding, you um, accept the responsibility for reporting these research outputs specifically to my office. And so we have a system called eLink that's collecting all of those research outputs. And so working kind of within that norm normal workflow, we're working to collect as many persistent identifiers within that metadata as possible and where appropriate assigned DOIs. And so, um, you know, for reports, for posters, for presentations. Um, we're working with Crossref to assign DOIs to those research outputs um, because we're seeing that, you know, they're not getting DOIs from other sources. We accept uh, DOIs for journal article accepted manuscripts, understanding that the publishers are the ones assigning DOIs. And, you know, through the, the metadata, we're, we're collecting ORCID IDs. Kind of in the back end, we're working to associate persistent identifiers um, for organizations and things like that. I'll talk a little bit more about it. On the data and software side of things, we're working with DataCite to assign DOIs to those research outputs. But if a DOI has already been ass assigned for, for any of these research outputs from another source, we accept that as we, we don't want two DOIs assigned to the same research output. Um, similar to Steve, we are kind of newer in the persistent identifiers for awards space. So we have a pilot service called our award DOI service, and we're working with Crossref to assign um, DOIs to awards um, coming from DOE. And that the pilot project where we've started is with some of the DOE user facilities. So these are typically housed at DOE national labs. They're things like um, light sources, neutron sources, computer, um, supercomputers, computers and, and folks can apply to use those facilities. And so when they submit a proposal, if that proposal is accepted, we work with the facility to assign an award DOI to those. 
We're also um, working around persistent identifiers for people, um, specifically uh, right now using ORCID IDs. So we lead the US government ORCID consortium, which is a mechanism for DOE organizations and other federal agencies and organizations to become ORCID members. And so we provide a community of practice and, and support for their ORCID memberships. We also have ORCID integrations um, in our primary search tool for finding DOE funded research outputs called OSTI.gov. And so, you know, folks uh, who are, are DOE funded will see their um, research output results uh, and records in OSTI.gov. And so um, we have a, a connection with ORCID. We're one of their search and link wizards that folks can search within OSTI.gov and kind of easily add their records into their ORCID profile, their ORCID record. And then uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, too, and in, in trying to kind of ease some of that administrative burden. Um, once you've given OSTI permission to um, push information into your ORCID record, if any new research outputs with your ORCID ID associated with that comes into OSTI, we'll push that into your ORCID record as well. And on the persistent identifier for organization side of things, um, for decades now, OSTI has maintained an internal organization authority. It really started as a way to disambiguate um, organization names. So one example we like to use is uh, one of the DOE national laboratories is Oak Ridge National Lab. And we have, I think, between 30 and 40 name variations that we've seen over the years. And so we capture all of those name um, variations and um, you know choose which one, a single uh, name that we're going to kind of display. And so one of the things that we're doing is working to uh, kind of re-envision that authority to not just include the name variations, but other information about the organization. So, um, you know, their addresses, their congressional districts and things like that, because that's really helpful information to have to start looking at impact and, and things like that. And uh, with that additional information, we're adding persistent identifiers associated with the organization. So um, whether it's ROAR IDs, um, the old grid identifiers, Wikipedia, Open Funder Registry. So we're, we're working to kind of collect all of those persistent identifiers and hoping to share this with other U.S. federal agencies as well. There's been a lot of interest. Um, I, you know, I think other organizations are doing this kind of work. So if we can share across the, the federal agencies, I think that would be really helpful. The other thing that we we kind of work on in this space is we maintain the DOE hierarchy for the Open Funder Registry with uh, Crossref and Elsevier. So making sure that all of the DOE funding offices have persistent identifiers in that registry. So if you go to the next slide, um, all of the information about our persistent identifier services, just kind of general information about persistent identifiers, um, you know, the benefits, the understanding impact, all of that can be found um, on this site, osteot.gov slash PIDs. Um, so we really wanted a space that's highlighting persistent identifiers and kind of talking about the value and the services that we provide. So if you go to the next slide, I just want to kind of quickly talk about, you know, how we're using persistent identifiers to kind of help in different ways. Um, the first is trying to help with reporting and kind of easing that administrative burden. And so um, I mentioned our, our system e-link that, you know, folks are required to submit research outputs to. So one of the things that we're trying to do, we talked about kind of connecting different systems. Um, you know, just because of how Department of Energy is set up, and I think uh, other federal agencies, we have a lot of different systems. And so we're working to streamline and connect those systems as much as possible to kind of streamline the reporting process to connect the, what we call the RPPR, or kind of the mid-year reporting with the reporting of research outputs to kind of streamline those processes and, and help ease that burden. And along the way, use persistent identifiers as much as possible um, to make all of that kind of submission of information easier. So one way that we're doing that is, you know, when you need to submit, uh, for example, a journal article accepted manuscript to us, if you have the DOI from the publisher, you can provide that to us and we auto populate all of the metadata associated with that DOI and bring it into our system to make it, uh, you know, easier to, to submit that to us. As I mentioned, we also have a connection with uh, with ORCID, and so if we've gotten permission, we can and and uh, 
the meta within the metadata for this record, your ORCID ID is included, we'll push that into your ORCID record as well. On the next slide, um, just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how we're working to use persistent identifiers to buy broaden discovery and make connections um, with information, um, you know, different components of the research lifecycle. So this is a data set record that we've assigned a DOI to. So you have the, the DOI uh, for that data set. Within that metadata, we want to include as many persistent identifiers along with the text as possible. And so um, I will say we are not doing all of this yet, but this is what we're working towards. So we want ORCID IDs for all of the research and authors. We want persistent identifiers, in this case, kind of ROAR IDs for the research organization, the sponsoring funding organizations. We want a DOI for the contract um, grant or award that funded this data set. And then this data set in particular has other research outputs associated with it. So um, it's connected to a publication, it's connected to another data set, and it's connected to a piece of software. And so we want uh, the DOIs for all of those research outputs to be connected, um, not only on kind of our landing page, but also within the DOI metadata. I think that's really important. So that way, um, whether it's with Crossref or data site, if you have that DOI, you can kind of pull all of that metadata associated with it. If you go to the next slide, um, this is another example. This is an award uh, DOI uh, landing page. So we've got the award DOI. We've got an ORCID ID for the investigator. We want, you know, a ROAR ID for their affiliation and for the awarding organization. And this award um, is connected to a journal article. And it's really great to see the connection kind of in the wild now for these award DOIs. So in the acknowledgement section, it, it acknowledges the user facility that assigned the award and acknowledges their ROAR ID, which is what that facility requested, which is great. And then in the funding um, kind of acknowledgement section, it includes the award DOI. So um, hopefully this is in the uh, journal article DOI metadata, and we also want to add it to the award DOI metadata to kind of have that two-way connection. And then lastly, um, on the next slide, I just wanted to kind of mention that, you know, persistent identifiers can be extremely helpful in starting to kind of understand impact, return on investment. Um, so, you know, we're just kind of talking about this at a high level right now, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking at kind of um, for some of the funding offices, what type of metrics and information we can provide using persistent identifiers. So, you know, we're looking at uh, things with um, DOIs assigned to the research outputs, looking at, you know, citations and connections um, between citations in different fields. Also want to kind of see those connections to other research outputs through related identifiers. And so, you know, this is early days on that, but, you know, our team that's really kind of looking at metrics and, and impact have said that, you know, when persistent identifiers are involved, it's just so much easier to be able to do that analysis. And so I think my last slide is just a thank you. And I believe we're going to try to hand it over to Sean. Yes. Yeah, so there is, so we do have a video for Sean's presentation. Um, uh, but we've also got Sean actually in the room right now. So are we set up, Howard, to do Sean's uh, slides or do we have to go to video? I, I think Sean wants to, I think Sean wants to do his own video. All right. Oh, we're all set up. I can see the first oh, one. Excellent. Yeah. Well, in that case, we'll yeah. hand over to uh, Sean Ross, who's a professor of history at uh, Macquarie University and um, also works at ARDC. Hi, can you hear me okay? Just checking my that my audio works and I'm- We can hear uh, you pretty well. Okay, great. Uh, I apologize for the drama. It's, um, it's 2 a.m. in Australia, so none of my colleagues could cover for me. And I've just arrived to field work uh, at Lake Mini near, near Corinth in Greece. So partly you should be jealous uh, that it's beautiful here, but uh, I, I'm sorry about any technical uh, glitches that we, uh, that, that we might have. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm from, uh, I, my name is Sean Ross, as I said, I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons, um, and I'll just say a few words about the ARDC first, uh, and then uh, get on with the rest of the uh, presentation. So uh, the Australian Research Data Commons um, is a, uh, is a, 
uh, not-for-profit company started in uh, 2019. It's one of 25 uh, organizations created under the Australian government's uh, National Collaboration Research Infrastructure Strategy. And you see those the logos for the others on the slide there. Um, and uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the ARDC's Australia's peak body for research data. Um, our uh, aim is to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high quality data sets. And the ARDC partners with uh, the research community, industry, and international collaborators to build leading edge digital infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So, what's so great? Uh, RAVE's a project uh, of the uh, of the ARDC, and it's a new uh, identifier. Uh, where the I think the newest addition to the portfolio of identifiers that you've been been hearing about, uh, and uh, a RAVE's and a, a persistent identifier for research project research projects and activities, um, which we are um, defining pretty broadly at this stage uh, until we see how people are, uh, are actually using it in the wild. Um, and it brings together uh, the organization's people's people inputs, outputs to a project and uh, ties that together with key project uh, information that's not found anywhere else. Um, we're governed by an ISO standard uh, under which the ARDC is the International Registration Authority setting pol policy and governance uh, and where we envision there being multiple registration agencies uh, who are actually minting raids and will be one for Australasia. Um, I would say it, sometimes it's easier to say what a raid isn't. Um, a raid's not for grants. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, it's not researchers, that's ORCID's got that covered. Uh, it's not really for durable organizations or organizational units. That's a ROAR. For many of these things, there's another identifier, so we don't use a RAID for it. Uh, and not for the kinds of output digital objects of various kinds, software data sets, instruments, um, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. So what, uh, how does a RAID work? Like a lot of, uh, like a lot of other PIDs, um, there's the RAID identifier and the metadata record. Um, the identifier, this slide it, it, uh, still says the handle system. I guess I can break some news here that it looks like um, uh, we're going to be using DOIs as a registration agency with uh, uh, the DOI foundation uh, rather than pure handles um, to create a, a globally unique persistent identifier. And then there's a metadata record with that. And if I could have the next slide, I'll show you, um, rather than reading through this list, I'll show you uh, what uh, something like what this looks like. Um, and here you see that uh, for the most part, uh, a RAID is a basket of other identifiers of, uh, of orchids for investigators, um, you know, where, and you can attach a, a role, like an administrative role to the investigator, as well as use the uh, credit ontology for um, contributions, um, roars for organizations, DOIs for grants, data sets, articles, et cetera, IGSNs for samples, um, and then a, a few key pieces of metadata. You can have title, multiple titles, multiple descriptions, start date, end date. You can have a geographical extent if you wanted a subject, um, uh, et cetera. Um, ne next slide, please. So why do we want to have a, a project ID? Um, and I'll go a little bit more into sort of problem solution uh, in just a minute, but in a, a, as a broad overview, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's quite a bit, uh, it takes quite a bit of resources to set up a new PID. And we, we looked at this at some depth at the ARDC um, and had some basic reasons why we thought a, a, and, and other stakeholders thought a project ID was appropriate. One is that where, you know, at least, you know, especially in sort of colloquial exchanges, you find people talk about what projects that they're working on, projects are where research happens, whether it's collaborative or, 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 or uh, individual researchers. Um, and we thought the project was a time limited but identifiable and meaningful container. Next, uh, projects you know, aren't, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to quite say next slide. I was just, <laughs> the next point there was that projects are not grants. Um, you know, that uh, I, I guess um, there has been a bit of confusion over this uh, but not in my discipline, not in history archaeology, where we are, where it's quite clear that uh, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between grants and projects. In that, many people go for much of their career 
uh, without and run several what you know uh, what they might colloquially refer to as a project without ever winning a grant. Where, whereas there might be other large projects in on the archaeology side of things that win multiple grants. So it's not sort of a one to one relationship. And the other thing, especially in talking to people at the Australian Research Council um, and other funders, uh, that um, the reporting window for grants is often too short to really capture everything that comes out of uh, the, the inputs, outputs, et cetera, that come out of a, of a grant. And we can capture those longer term impacts and tie them back to sort of more remote sources of funding that were still crucial to the, uh, um, uh, to the outcomes and impact. Um, next, projects. Uh, when we looked at, well, could other identifiers be used for, for projects? And one sort of fundamental issue there was that projects evolve and a lot of identifiers expect a stable target or a stable digital object, an entity. Um, but on projects, people come and go, organizations join and leave, new grants are won, new publications come out. And we didn't want to keep reassigning, um, you know, taking snapshots and reassigning that. So uh, a RAID is meant to evolve uh, over time and provide a uh, history essentially of the um, uh, of the project um, and also pro uh, uh, here finally projects are where research is often administered whether it's in a local research information system um, whether it's in um, the meta project level metadata requirements that are repository um, in, in, a, in a number of settings projects are uh, already assumed um, so it's where it can be administered next slide please so just very quickly here, the idea is to take the various research components uh, of, uh, uh, that are connected to a project and uh, tie them together. And the next slide illustrates that. So there, and pull them together um, where the RAID becomes a nexus of research inputs and, uh, and outputs uh, and assigns to them a permanent uh, a persistent identifier and uh, associates appropriate project information. Next slide, please. So I wanted to do a little bit more uh, depth here about the problems and the solutions. So um, in our business analysis that we've done as we're, as we're developing RAID, um, what we found is that information about projects is distributed and siloed. It's partly in research information systems, partly in other uh, university systems like finance systems, stuff like that. Uh, other information might be on uh, staff profiles uh, or a project website or an OS, an open science foundation project. Um, and that between all these things, there's lots of double entry of data um, and, uh, and, and uh, difficulty in coordinating uh, across organizations, especially. Um, that as I've already alluded to, uh, out, um, outputs, outcomes, impact, tracking these things can be hard because of the larger, longer time frames that, um, uh, are my, that a project might operate over compared to shorter reporting time frames for a grant. Uh, and that project outcomes, you know, that they're in, sometimes they're sort of more than the sum of the parts of individual or uh, of, uh, that you could capture from individual orchids, or at least it's quite a bit of work to pull all of those together, separate what a, a, an individual person might be uh, involved with several projects and sort of sorting out which out, uh, outputs go with which, uh, uh, which projects. So, um, it, you know, uh, uh, providing a mechanism to tie those things uh, together. Um, from uh, you know, uh, part of the the argument here is efficiency, but part of it's also uh, around open science that project metadata isn't re it, it isn't really routinely or comprehensively captured. Um, it may be required by data repositories uh, as project level metadata, but by that point, that late in the you know in the uh, in the research life cycle, it may be difficult to reconstruct uh, what a pro of the contributors funders. Et cetera, of a, of a project at a particular point in time, were unless that's been recorded as you go along. Um, and right now, it's often not recorded as you go along and maintained instead in an ad hoc manner and sometimes lost. Um, and, I, and we think that this is an important part of provenance uh, for outputs like data sets and publications. Um, and right now, there's a, a, a lack of standardization, uh, a lack of way of, uh, of um, information that's collected about projects uh, that we want to address. So next slide, please. 
So with a RAID, we can have a single source of truth that reduces double entry of data and saves time and administra uh, ad administration, um, both around input and, uh, and, and output. Um, so supports reporting and impact measurements, um, uh, giving you a variety of uh, insights into, uh, into outputs. It supports tools. It's all machine readable, so it can support tools built on it for uh, analysis and decision making. Um, and it captures the uh, prov uh, provenance, uh, captures the provenance of the research, uh, giving you snapshots at different points in time and a cumulative history of the project, as well as standardization under the ISO standard. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just a brief extract from uh, a uh, cost benefit analysis that More Brains did. Um, if we look at Austra even just Australia alone, which as you can see has about 20,000 projects, and you can see how that might scale from the other figures presented here, that even uh, just looking at Australia, um, the, this uh, analysis reported uh, almost 3,000 person days a year and around um, $3 million a year of efficiency gain savings from implementing RAID and an order of magnitude more when combined with other persistent identifiers. Next slide, please. And uh, so uh, this is just a quick overview of where we're at now. A pilot um, RAID service was run for several years by the ARDC. That's now been uh, upgraded to the new software stack. Um, they have redeveloped and upgraded. Uh, as I've already mentioned, we've got the ISO uh, certification. So that's um, uh, that's done. Um, in progress now is extending this service with the new uh, metadata schema, developing landing pages. We envision this to work something like an ORCID that you will hit a standardized landing page first and then be offered redirection towards a local project page. Um, we're updating the API and interface and improving integrations with other PIDs to make it as you know, automated or easy as uh, possible to pull together the various PIDs that go into a RAID. Um, and we're working on the RAID reg registration agency handbook um, encapsulating policy and governance at the same time. Um, we should have a beta uh, out for the service by the end of this year with partners in Europe, particularly SURF in the Netherlands, um, and uh, drafts of the policy and governance at that time. Um, so that's RAID and uh, that's, uh, that's uh, where we're at. And if you just flip to the last slide, it's some contact information and I will wind up. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ross. And thank you to all of the speakers. Uh, we've done a good job of staying on time, um, despite the uh, minor technical hiccup from the power outage. Um, so we've done we've done really well so far. So we wanted to sort of open up the Q&A now. And, uh, and just to remind everybody, if you have any questions in the audience, please do drop them in the Q&A, um, because we've got some time for a little bit of a chat. But we wanted to start off by talking to um, a researcher, by talking to, uh, to Kevin. I'm going to give you a second, Kevin, to uh, introduce yourself. And then I'd like you to answer a question for us, um, a question about your experiences interacting with um, research administration writ large, if you like, um, the kind of bureaucratic burden that we're talking about. So we've talked about various efforts to try to reduce that. We wanted to learn a little bit about your experience of this and some of the stories perhaps that you could tell us about, um, you know, which systems you'll use or which funders you'll work with or try to avoid um, and that sort of thing. So uh, do, do tell us about that, Kevin. Okay, so uh, I'm a, a professor in a computer science and engineering department. I work mainly in machine learning and computer vision. Uh, a senior researcher, I've been EIC of two different IEEE transactions. We have a large lab, graduate PhD students consume money from various federal and private agencies in the United States. Um, as I listened, I had different reactions to all sorts of things, but I was, I was, as I was listening, I, I thought about the research overhead component and how I uh, dislike re-entering information. And I did, I have had thoughts about how I, uh, when there are choices, go to agencies that result in less overhead on my research effort. But as I was thinking forward going, uh, data sets and software were mentioned, I think, in every presentation. Uh, and in my area, uh, the data sets are quite often large data sets of images that will have people visible in them. And the software now is, is quite often uh, neural network architectures and weights uh, are the software for them. And the current de facto uh, standard is that 
researchers will publish this data, if I can use the word publish, with the URL of, of their at their institution quite often, or or perhaps at a professional society. But I think the the greatest increase in productivity in research and impact in research for my discipline in the near future could result from a, a better standardization of access to software and data sets from previous research to be used in my research to create new data sets and software. And I'm and I'm curious if if any of the other speakers um, have an idea of where they think this is going. Are publishers going to take responsibility for uh, publishing software and data sets? Are the funding agencies going to take responsibility? Is it going to stay with the agents with the universities that receive the money uh, and and where the research is carried out? Is there a preferred path for this? And how will access to these things be worked out, say, when uh, uh, something like the EU passes a privacy law and some data sets that were previously OK to use are not, at least if you're in the EU, but they might be for the rest of the world? And how will those sorts of restrictions be uh, enforced on top of the persistent identifiers. Yes, yeah, so Carly, um, maybe you'd like to come in on that a little bit as a funder. Um, so what's your what's your sort of view on who should take responsibility for um, and who act as the publisher for the data set and uh, absorb the risk, I guess, is what Kevin was talking about a little bit. No, I think that's a really interesting question, and I don't know that I have a specific answer because I do I do think it may vary, um, and I think there's good reasons um, why it may vary. So across the the U.S. funders, there has been kind of a, a distributed approach right now, and I, I'll talk maybe about data and software, um, and and so uh, you know I think. There are some agencies who have put a lot of effort into developing data repositories and, you know, they're kind of um, internal to the agencies and folks that, you know, are, are maybe doing research within the agencies or extramurally funded kind of um, go to. They're often discipline specific. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, NIH comes to mind. Um, NSF, I think, you know, has taken a slightly different approach where they fund those um, extramural repositories, often discipline specific. Um, DOE is kind of a mix. A lot of those are at our national labs. I'll say on the software side, the software is still, um, at least in terms of the federal agencies and how they think about capturing software, um, it, it's still pretty broad. So Lori hit on some of the policies that talk about publications and data. Some agencies combine data and software together um, under the Obama administration. You know, there was a lot of kind of discussion around policies around software. And I'll say, you know, DOE and I think NASA are doing a lot to collect software as much as possible and make it publicly available. And so we have software repositories. We're assigning DOIs to kind of help with that dissemination. Um, you know, a lot of folks are developing open source. So we're trying to have connections with, you know, GitHub, GitLab instances to make sure that we're kind of connecting where folks are. But it, it's really early days there. So I don't think I'm answering Kevin's question on who should take responsibility because unfortunately I think it's pretty distributed, but it is a really good question. And I'm hoping, you know, as agencies are developing and, and other funders are developing policies around this, trying to be as explicit as possible about where data or software should go. Um, and if there is not specifics, trying to give as many options as possible, because that's what we've heard is, okay, you tell us the data needs to be made available, but how do we actually do that? Um, and and I'll, I'll just say at DOE, that's something that we're, that we're trying to work on because we're trying to give a lot of flexibility. Um, it turns out maybe that's not as helpful as we thought it was. No, I, I think your your answer makes sense to me. There's it, it is a very confusing uh, set of options that are available, and it's not clear as a researcher what you want to do. Do you want to hold on to it because maybe there's some future value to it for you? Does it belong to your institution? Does it belong with the paper that describes the data set and the algorithm? It's it's a hard hard situation to figure out what the right approach is. 
Mm. So let's put a pin in that for a second, because there's a bit there about coordination that Carly just touched on between different funders, right? Because um, as everybody knows, research may be funded on a national level, but it's conducted on a global level. So there's an important conversation, I think. But I want to stick a pin in that and just go to Laurie to see if you have any thoughts from an institutional perspective um, about responsibility for data sets. Yeah, and I appreciate the question and, and Carly's response because the answer is kind of it depends. And to all of the examples that Dr. Boyer gave, um, yes is the answer to all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, one of the th in, in determining responsibility, I'm not even talking about storage size. I mean, my, uh, my background is a nod to the space sciences that happen at my institution. So again, we're talking about extremely large data sets and software. Uh, NASA has come out with some ideas about how they want software to be shared, although their policy are not formed up yet. But for, for us, aside from the size of the data, the outstanding question is for how long? should it be stored? Um, you know, a lot of these data policies, data sharing policies say long-term storage, but no one knows what that means. Um, you know, forever, uh, in, in 20 years when we're talking, when we're using a completely different uh, way to read online software than we're doing today that doesn't exist yet, like how are we going to look at it? I think part of it, part of it is, is some of these unanswered questions and uh, the, 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 the needs of individual disciplines for the size of storage. So. Right. Okay, so uh, yeah, so another question that I'd like to sort of touch on is uh, I'd like to give Scott a chance to come in on a slightly different topic. Um, so Scott, um, maybe you just care a minute to introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about the work that you're doing, uh, that you do at Optica and, um, and trying to create ways to sort of connect research entities without creating too much of that researcher burden that we've heard a lot about. Yes, thanks, Phil, and hello, everybody. I'm Scott Deneen. I've spent most of my career at what is now Optica, formerly the Optical Society of America. And we publish 19 journals. And like all publishers, we've invested heavily in trying to organize versions of research, um, take in metadata from all different formats and try to organize it and validate it well. And I guess listening to the speakers, two things occurred to me to talk about. The first one is versioning because, uh, well, we just launched a new preprint server. So there's yet another version, but we've got the preprint. We have often a conference paper that might start as a poster um, and then different versions of a manuscript before the final version is published. And there are different obligations that go with these different versions. Uh, for example, even if we're doing a uh, plagiarism check. You know, it's important not only for us as a publisher to know, but other publishers to know, is this, is this research that was prevented at, presented at a conference, so it, it, it's okay if there's duplication, that, that sort of thing. Um, but versioning is important for the, uh, the author as well. The author may have an obligation to make that research green open access and needs to use the right version, needs to use the accepted manuscript version. So again, just back to our investment as a publisher, we've invested heavily in being able to distinguish versions, assign DOIs and register them at the right step to use things like uh, cover sheets and cover pages and try not to let that interfere with indexing like with Google Scholar. So there, there, there's a lot of stuff. Um, it, it's still difficult, but it, it, it is something that we're all invested in. Um, just a quick word about metadata curation. Uh, I think what's still hard, both for the author and for the publisher, are uh, funder names, grant IDs, and institutional names, because they come in all different formats. Publishers aren't typically getting PIDs when manuscripts are submitted. We're, we're prompting authors with big drop-down lists or taking what they submit in the manuscript. Nevertheless, we have invested heavily both in knowledge and technology and partner uh, services to try to get this information into the article, get it cleaned up, validated, uh, check back with the author, and ultimately registered uh, mainly with Crossref if we're talking about the, the ROR's and the funder IDs. Yeah, so um, yeah, Laurie, you spoke a little bit, didn't you, about um, about the various use cases why people would need data. And so is clean institutional data something that uh, you know affects uh, you? And I suppose Carly as well, um, is that a question? That, uh, does that does that affect the work that you do in terms of trying to understand the impact of the work that you fund? So, Laurie, do you want to go first? 
Sure, sure, it, it definitely does, and I and I think for us, it's understanding understanding the output of funded research, both externally funded and internally funded, uh, around around the things that might come as a result of that output. And that's a data and publications are certainly one of the ways we measure impact around research. Um, and I and I think that uh, I think that for us, it, it's. While we may not be using the data ourselves, we are looking at um, how it how it's used outside of our our our, our universes and our universities. But also, um, I think it's really a nod to having it available to change the way science is communicated, particularly in this country. And I think that's what is the more, most important use. There are a lot of things we can get for ROI, but a lot, a lot of it is about having the data to replicate results outside of our own research labs. Right. Yeah, so uh, so Carly, a similar sort of question. So thinking about in terms of of um, uniquely identifying things, uh, we all know about authors, uh, but also there's institutional identifiers as well. How critical is that in order to understand, uh, you know, the work and the the the, the impact of the stuff that uh, that a funder funds? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is really critical. And that's why, you know, I had mentioned we, we've been kind of looking at this for decades, but persistent identifiers for organizations didn't exist when we started this work. And so that's why we kind of created these internal authorities. And so, um, you know, our, our ingest systems are kind of built on these. And, and what we're doing now is building in persistent identifiers to all of those kind of because there are a lot of persistent, well, there are a lot of identifiers. I think some meet our definition of persistent and some don't for organizations, right? We're trying to capture as much of that information in our authorities as possible so that we can kind of disambiguate if we're, we're getting kind of external data. Internally, we're able to disambiguate pretty easily with our own authorities. Um, Scott mentioned kind of the, the drop down lists and things like that. And, and we're able to kind of get pretty far. We're not asking people to provide us identifiers. We're asking them to provide us the names of the organizations. We do the disambiguation and the adding the identifiers ourselves. And we're developing, um, for us, a kind of a reconciliation API where if we get the name of an organization or a persistent identifier, we can run that through our system and kind of, you know, match it ac across the board. So that's really kind of what, what we're looking to do. And I, I think Steve probably is doing a lot in this space as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, I'll just go to Steve in a second, but yeah, there's a big um, area that I am always interested in, which is the difference between um, creating quality metadata at source and then having to, in the absence of that metadata, having to sort of uh, rebuild it, if you like, using various sorts of advanced technology. And there's a lot of organizations, a lot of companies that, that uh, do great work in sort of reassembling data when it's incomplete. And in some senses, that's almost like a sticking plaster, right? So we have to make sure that we're focusing on making metadata better going forward to minimize the need to do this sort of thing, I guess. So I wanna to go to Steve um, next, because we did, I did say we'll stick a pin on the coordination piece, right? And I know this is something that you're interested in, um, Steve. Um, so, uh, so with, as I said, research is done on a global level, but funded on a national level. So how do we, um, square that circle. To what degree are funders already talking to each other and coordinating this stuff? And uh, to what degree do they need to be in the future? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think funders should be collaborating more. I, I think it's a, you know, it's a challenging industry where the, just the motion of doing the work to award a grant, right? To, to post the funding opportunity, get them reviewed, um, what we see across the board is just the staff and especially on the nonprofit side, right? I mean, they, they do amazing things with, with very <laughs> limited resources and for them to think, Oh, I should be collaborating with lots of other funders around the world to share data and share ideas and share, you know, Hey, we funded some of our projects is, is really tricky. Um, but I think, you know, that's one thing we're working on with convening conferences and trying to get funders together and, and talk about that. Um, I did want to touch on something real quick that ha that Kevin mentioned on about the the global data distribution and where data is stored. I I just think one troubling thing that we've seen across the board is that, and this is just using Proposal Central, right? We are not a research management system in terms of the actual outputs, and I mean they might get progress reports, but you know there's many data systems at many organizations around the world that are storing like the actual outputs, like the massive data sets, like Lori was talking about, and things that happen at DOE. And we're finding more and more funders around the world want their systems. They want Proposal Central 
to be held in their countries. And, you know, it's stored in the United States. And not only that, but so are all these persistent identifiers. Like, I'm not even sure where the rate data is, but, you know, ORCID data is stored in the United States. And I don't know where, where Crossref or data site data is stored either, but all these funders want to interact with all these ecosystems, but they want all the data stored in their countries. And it's it's been very, very challenging uh, working with Canadian organizations, organizations in the Middle East. A recent Australia RFP said all the data had to be stored in Australia. And, and we said, well, what about, you know, ORCID data? And, well, maybe we won't use ORCID then. And, you know, so it that overall, I think, is something that the, the global ecosystem needs to needs to work through. Yeah, that's a big challenge, isn't it? Um, yeah, Colin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is this something that uh, comes up in your work? And, you know, uh, and uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, no, it definitely has come up. And I think um, Lori talked about um, National Security Presidential Memo yeah. number 33. And that's kind of one piece thinking about research security. It's not necessarily on kind of where data is stored, but just in terms of kind of security of information. I think that's a, a, a topic in the U.S. government that folks are thinking a lot about. Um, I haven't kind of heard it explicitly yet about the data being stored in the U.S., but I will say one thing that we've run into the persistent identifier organizations are absolutely wonderful, but they're also trying to support millions of users, right, at, at certain times. And so we have found that sometimes um, for some of like the analytics metrics, um, it's easier for us to get a copy um, and mine that copy um, just in terms of kind of time and efficiency. And so I, I think there are other organizations that are doing some of that, but that's one of the wonderful things about all of this information being open, right? Is that you can do that kind of work um, and you know try to work with the organizations as much as possible, but also don't want to kind of bog down their systems on you know thousands of API calls in a second and <laughs> things like that. So so I have kind of heard about that not you know, I have definitely heard about what, what Steve is talking about. I haven't heard about it in the U.S. government yet, although I would not be surprised if that comes up. But I think there might be reasons to kind of house a copy of it for uh, for other reasons as well. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's very different to housing your own copy of something and, and insisting that everything is kept within, you know, your own country. Of course, one of those is, you know, fairly trivial, provided you have the storage for it. And the other one can be quite difficult, particularly with distributed um, you know, modern distributed uh, architecture. Um, so Laurie, did you want to come in on that as well? Because you talked about national security and that sort of thing. And when we were talking, um, you know, a week or so ago about the national security issue, it's a it's an interesting one because it's a conversation, the way that it's framed in the US, that's only really happening in the US in that context, in that framing, in that precise framing. Um, so do you think that I don't know, maybe in the future, is that uh, going to be something that's going to be picked up in other countries, perhaps, to what extent you could talk about that? Or is this going to be something that the US is going to sort of change its own view? Or, or is there going to be sort of different sort of local views on this, do you think? I, you know, I think probably a mix. Um, I think that... It to, in the coordination question, this is where we've seen a, a, the, maybe the most coordination across federal agencies in the U.S. around this topic, which I think is very encouraging because I think that some of these agencies are learning about how they can use PIDs for the first time for their own purposes um, and not, not even talking about the data storage question. I think that the way that we're framing research security in the U.S., both with NSPM 33 and legislation like the Chips and Science Acts is a specific U.S. frame, but this is not, this is not a unique topic. Um, the G7 countries bring up research security and possible undue foreign influence in a multitude of different ways. I just do think that they will handle it differently. Yeah. Right. So there's uh, we've got to wait and see how things sort of play out and how those how those sort of conversations, um, you know, evolve. So, I mean, shifting gear a little bit, I wanted to come back to um, to Kevin again uh, and maybe to sort of seed another um, conversation around. Um, one way I've heard it expressed is PIDs as the one thing that you have to do or, uh, you know, pick a bit like ORCID is the one thing you have to do versus the one more thing. That you have to do. Um, so uh, we, you know, we want to reduce administrative burden, but also I hear from people that sometimes putting your data and your ORCID record seems like an added burden when it should be something that reduces the burden. Um, so how do we turn that corner and make it so that 
um, these infrastructures that we're developing make it so that life is easier and uh, and avoid the risk of making life harder for folks? That's a question to me. <laughs> yes, as a researcher, as what would you what do you need to see? Right? How does your life need to be different? How do the systems that you interact with need to change to make your life yeah, easier? I think, I think they need to be uh, easier to use. Uh, some of the first rollout of some things, and I, I won't mention the one I mentioned er, earlier. Um, I found incredibly awkward. Like nobody from human computer interface had tested this at all. To, to make sure that it was easy to use. And uh, the process of bringing information over from one database to another, yes, there is an API and yes, it's supposed to work, but it doesn't always work smoothly. So I think uh, more user testing perhaps by the user community in a, in a beta format before it's rolled out and required by some agencies, uh, at least it has happened in the US would, would uh, benefit the individual researcher uh, to some degree by making things easier and less frequent changes in it, right? So we learn a new system and two years later, someone realizes, oh, that wasn't right. And we've got another new system for you to learn that's doing the same thing that the system a couple of years ago did. Um, and, and I think those would be ways of making it easier. Yeah, so Scott, you work for a learning society. So uh, you must uh, interact with researchers. Um, so what are your, um... What is your sort of thought on on this? I mean, you talked about reducing burden. What do researchers tell you? Yeah, one thing I didn't mention is that the overwhelming number of submissions we get are from China. So I know Carly, you'd mentioned that you know you you have versions of names for things that can all be reduced down to one thing. But if we're really looking at a, a truly global authoring community and a large number of researchers coming from China. For us in the US, it's just very, very difficult even to take um, what, what the authors are providing and do the work we do to make it easier. So we do have to raise the burden a little bit on authors by, again, showing them drop down lists that might be difficult to navigate. Uh, to Kevin's point, we, we do try to do a lot of user testing to make them palatable, but there, there will still be, still be complaints. Um, we do try to rely on the investments we made now over decades to uh, be able to take the most important metadata and polish it up and, and validate it. And I, the, uh, what's new for us, and I'll end with this, at least for this part of the question, the ROR, ROR IDs, the institution IDs, they're very important now. Why? Because like many publishers, we're doing these read and publish deals where if your institution is participating, then we will pay your APC for your paper. But how do we know if you're participating? That needs to be done in a very formal way. And we're using ROR uh, IDs for that. So that, that's become a new important part of our process and fill a little bit more of a burden now for authors who submit to us, because it's another drop down list. Where are you from? Just a difficult question to answer a lot of times. Seems like it shouldn't be, but it often is. Yeah, so Sean, um... It's what pl what part does RAID play in in this? Are there ways in which um, looking at something through the lens of projects can make some of this um, you know sort of collection a little bit uh, a little bit easier? Can make it easier to sort of find and cross sort and discover stuff so that it doesn't so that it's so that it's less burdensome to be able to assemble stuff. Uh, yeah, I think you've mentioned uh, earlier that, um, you know, there's a lot of work that's being put into, and I, I hear this from my colleagues at EOS, that European Open Science Cloud, uh, a lot, that, well, we're going to write machine learning algorithms that go out and reconstruct projects from the information that's out there. That tells me a couple of things. One, that, um, that it is important to have this information pulled together, uh, that there's a demand for project information that is not transparently uh, available um, you know so uh, so it's reassuring in that way the part that concerns me more is I, I've done it's certainly not the main focus of my research but I've done just enough with machine learning and uh, you know image analysis and stuff to realize that wow that uh, the chances of that working um, smoothly and without lots of errors and without lots of human intervention to build the uh, training data sets and check the outcome that it's not going to work um, you know so uh, and if you're putting in that kind of effort, why not just 
you know, um, capture the thing uh, instead of trying to reconstruct the thing. I, I don't know that that's going to save a lot of effort. Um, I think this is related to another strand of research that I do is on um, the uh, uh, adoption of digital technologies in archaeology. And I see, I hear some resonance in what some other people are saying with that is that a lot of the problems with, that the payoff comes after uh, an initial investment in time that for years, I mean, I've been keeping, first it was a Word document, now it's a Confluence page, you know, about projects, because I get asked constantly, well, who was on this project at this time? What funding did you have on that project at that time? And it's a lot of work to go reconstruct that after the fact, but it's also, I, I sympathize a, a great deal with some of the uh, things that have been said that it is difficult to find the time to avoid that technical debt and keep a record as you go along. Um, you know, but, uh, and, and in some ways we've found in, in, you know, in the adoption of technologies or in the disciplines that I work in, it's, it's to an extent an irreducible pro problem that if you want the payoff later, you've got to invest the time up front and there's no way around. And the keys are what's been mentioned, make, the, make it as easy to use as possible, automate whatever you can. Um, where you can't automate it, provide tools to um, help acquire you know, uh, the information that you need, et cetera. So I hope that's answered your, <laughs> your question. Yes, that's a, that's an excellent answer. Yeah. I think that's, um, it's, uh, it's very important to, uh, to see these things as an entire sort of ecosystem and, uh, and then the, the use of the connections between these things can make it much easier to be able to assemble and discover and to, and to make information uh, flow from system to system. And of course, those integrations are, are vitally important to making that work as well. So with that, we are out of time. So I will just hand you back to Howard, who will uh, say goodbye. Well, that was a fantastic session. It's a, it always amazes me when we always run over time and we've got more to talk about. Uh, there's so much to think about. I'm sure this will parlay into many other chorus forums. And so, uh, first of all, a huge thank you to our moderator, Phil, and our panelists. I appreciate all the effort that you put in today. Also, a big thank you again to our sponsors, ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. And then finally, just do note, that we will be having more events throughout the year. Uh, keep an eye out on chorusaccess.org slash events. And uh, in fact, one of the things that we'll be doing later in the year is research impact. So the things that you folks talked about today will easily slide into that conversation. So I do appreciate everyone attending and everyone who was speaking today and have a wonderful day. Thank you.